As Joe noted, one really important point here is that we are really at the very beginning of seeing what is going on. And, what we are seeing in the credit markets is a rate pricing of risk initially, investors were pricing their investments. And the kind of deals they were asking for were ones where they had a historically low premium required for the risk that they were taking. And now, the pendulum has swung much the other way, because I think that people really don't understand exactly how much risk they are taking, and I'm sure that they are waiting on the sidelines to see. Tesla showed that you could make a luxury electric car for a profit. That got the attention of other luxury car makers also, government regulations from California and other states that promote electric vehicles. Automakers used to respond to these mandates half-heartedly. They'd build what's called a compliance car. Chelsea Sexton, an industry consultant and electric vehicle advocate explains, it is expensive, it's low volume, it's hard to get, it's somehow engineered to be a little bit unattractive in some way very low range, etc, etc. Fuel cells are the most efficient devices for generating energy, so that combination of low emissions and efficient energy is the real key to the future for lower carbon. I think the fact is that people feel this research is now going somewhere very definite, that the cars that people drive say in 5 or 10 years will be hydrogen or certainly electrical, possibly driven by hydrogen fuel also. Your houses will be much cleaner. They will have renewable fuels again driven by fuel cells and many of the things that we use as gadgets like computers, cameras, they will also have fuel cells.
Working together, they figured out that if the government was going to propose some kinds of significant tax increases, which is a good strategy, quite me to at least tie something like getting something for those big tax breaks, not seeing any results. So the result of that was in the package of legislation that included the tax increases. There was awesome information to have significant expansion of coverage families where they can buy into their private insurance. An economist sees the world basically through a typical microeconomic toolkit that involves things like thinking at the margin rationality, opportunity cost, trade-offs. Economists, like any other discipline or dogma, has its own jargon and its own rules and its own way of seeing the world. So basically economics, or economists in general, tend to apply microeconomic concepts like that to explain the way humans behave and to make predictions about the future. Well, Alex, the National Association of Realtors is at least putting the champagne on ice. The industry group says the slight rise in sales for previously owned homes shows the housing market is finally stabilizing, which is the first sign of a recovery. Now, that of course is an interpretation of the numbers, Alex, and one that's coming from an organization known for being somewhat of a cheerleader for the housing market. Since its members are made up of realtors who've been losing a lot of money in the slump. Now, for a more sober view, I talked to Wellesley housing economist Carl Case, and he says the slight uptick in sales hardly offsets the fact that numbers are down 20% from the year before.
Well, basically just hitchhiking on the point. If you look at the customers of the Wall Street Journal, the basically financial news, financial people here are people who rely on sound, valid, and timely data to make investment decisions. They look at things and track trends in the industry, worrying about things like profit maximization. If they even suspected that political issues or ideological issues from the editorial page were going to start affecting the flow of valid financial information, if they even thought that ideological issues were going to affect their ability to understand investments and make sound decisions, they'd get very upset. In that month or six weeks, the patient may feel perfectly well. He may even travel around the world spending hours packed into crowded airplanes with unsuspecting fellow passengers. That's bad enough with regular TB or with strains that are resistant to two or three mainline drugs used to treat the disease. But it's a potential public health catastrophe with a new strain called XDR-TB. For extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, the strain is impervious to a wide array of first- and second-line drugs. That's why 30% or more of its victims die. And that's why people like Lawrence Gostin are rethinking what public health authorities should do about people with suspected XDR-TB in the weeks before the diagnosis is in. For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lucier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted.
the ocean has been getting bluer, according to a study published in the journal Nature. But that's not really good news for the planet. It means that the plants that tin the ocean green aren't doing so well. Scientists say that's because the ocean has been getting warmer. Well in 2004 we integrated ticketing in southeast Queensland, so we introduced a paper ticket that allowed you to travel access all the three modes in southeast Queensland, so bus, train and ferry. And the second stage of integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card, and the smart card will enable people to store value, so to put value on the card, and then to use the card for traveling around the system. This is one thing we can say about babies, human babies compared to babies of other species is that we are entirely dependent on our carers to bring us up and for us to survive. And so it's very important for babies to get into relationships with somebody who's going to look after them well. So, biology has meant that babies and the adults are geared up to be in relationship with each other from the start. The effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views, by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens, whose wisdom may best discern the true interest of their country, and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations.
It is about a hundred years since that great Canadian-born physician Sir William Osler, Regis Professor of Medicine in Oxford, complained about the increasing influence of the pharmaceutical industry on the medical professions. If he knew how this influence had increased since then, he would be turning in his grave at the way the industry now dominates doctors. Prescribing habits. It does this not only by direct and indirect pressure on the doctors themselves, but also by encouraging the public to ask for scripts and to demand that governments provide the money. And one particular crop, almonds in the US and now in Australia, is transforming the world of beekeeping and of bees. What has happened is that something serendipitous came along that people found out, that doctors found out that almonds are good for you, they are actually a food that is normally considered a confection, but it's good for you. The almond board got a very aggressive promotion going on for almonds. I just heard recently, they send out sales reps to cardiologists at hospitals to promote the heart benefits of almonds, so they go right to the doctors to do this. So they leave no stone unturned in a very good promotion of almonds, and it's legitimate promotion because they are a healthy food. So what's happened is worldwide. Almond sales have taken off. There's little doubt that genetically modified crops have the potential to offer great benefits to the world, yet they continue to be opposed by many people, even though any risks attached to their use have not been clearly established. The reasons seem to be a deep distrust of the motives of large agricultural companies, along with a generalized feeling that it's always dangerous to, as some would put it, play around with nature.
signs that secured borrowing remains robust in firm data on manufacturing and retail sales, released on Thursday, painted the picture of an economy that has yet to be cooled by the recent spate of interest rate rises. Again, I want to repeat that I don't blame libertarians for this state of affairs. My argument is really that they simply have nothing to offer us in this debate. When we talk about trying to get rid of the welfare policies that have enabled some of the breakdown of family, that is undoubtedly important but I think we're beyond that at this point. The damage is so deep, and it's kind of hard for me to envision a future without social security, for instance. I quite agree with the analysis that the Social Security, Medicare and that sort of thing, have decreased the primary functions of the family. But I cannot imagine a world in which we get rid of these things. So that we will be from a pragmatic point of view we have to think about what we can do to try to bolster up this breakdown that I keep referring to. Green chemistry is a concept designed to develop technologies which allow chemistry to be practiced with minimal damage to the environment or in an environmentally compatible way, and it's meant to cover both chemical processes and chemical products. The center was set up about seven or eight years ago, and the idea was to provide a hub of activities that covered fundamental research work, international collaboration, but also educational development on public understanding of the project as well and also networking so we network out to well over 1,000 people around the globe.
Dave Hackenberg, a beekeeper since 1962, can usually tell what killed his bees just by looking at them. If they're lying on the ground in front of a hive, it's probably pesticides, he says. If the bees are deformed and wingless, it's probably vampire mites. But last fall, Hackenberg saw something he had never seen before. Thousands of his bee colonies simply disappeared. He was in Florida at the time, pulling the lids off some of his commercial hives. To his horror, they were all empty. There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in the country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news, according to our guests today. And that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels and digital technology. And they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guests today will help answer that. During the past week, NPR has been reporting on the growing income gap in America. Economists say one big reason for the widening divide is the steady loss of manufacturing jobs. As more and more U.S. companies move factory jobs overseas, people who lack skills and education have trouble making a decent living. When the carrier air conditioning company shut down its Syracuse, New York plant in 2004, 1,200 jobs were lost. The current financial state of the laid-off workers depends on their skills, age, and degree of determination.
Okay, so let's have a quick summary, because we've galloped through a bit of philosophy here. I've suggested that we're rationally required to do what morality requires of us, so it's reasonable that tells us what we should and shouldn't do. If we don't do what rationally requires of us, this is because we are ignorant, or, if you don't agree with Aristotle or Socrates, we're possibly weak or corrupt. And we may be ignorant of what morality requires of us, because we are relying on others. So what's all this got to do with climate change? And as far as getting acquired, I mean, you know, we're trying to focus on the product. I think that if you know a lot of companies are built to be acquired, and I think what happens there is you leave yourself in a really vulnerable spot because you're growing and you say, hey, I won't hire that expensive VP of whatever because, hey, man, any day now we're going to get acquired. And then your product winds up suffering. So I think you need to really want to do the company because you don't know how long you're going to be at it. And luckily, I've been searched a long time. I don't want to stay in search, so you know it's fine with me whatever happens with the company. But you have to focus on building the product to making the product better, and you have to focus on building a sustainable company. It all started last spring when the Food and Drug Administration placed a black box warning on some popular anemia drugs. The labels warn against using the drugs in cancer patients with relatively mild anemia resulting from chemotherapy. The FDA says the drugs clearly shorten survival and speed the progression of cancer. In people with slightly worse anemia, the drugs might have the same effects. To Barry Straub, Medicare's chief medical officer, the message was clear.
I'm absolutely delighted first of all to have been appointed to this professorship. The role is going to be about public engagement in science. It is about making science accessible to as wide an audience as possible. It's about encouraging young people to think about science as a career. It's about making it easier for our academics here at the University of Birmingham to talk about their research to the general public. And it's not just about a one-way flow of information. It very much is about a dialogue. Why do we need more entrepreneurs right now? The entrepreneurs who create and run our businesses, who play by the rules, are in fact critical to our success as a nation. We need them especially today. First, we need them to solve the current crisis. Business, not government, will end this recession. Government must help by creating fair rules, sound monetary policy, and by protecting our fellow citizens in periods where they are jobless. But the government has to stand to the side and let new entrepreneurial firms challenge companies that can no longer compete. We have to make way for the new entrepreneurial firms that will push us to frontiers of innovation. Now that story's been scotched as only part of contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother, considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Murray something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is their predicament something we have to face up to as a nation?
Those of you who've never heard the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that pseudo-Latin which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books, useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world, Classical Latin. So, what's so new about it? You've heard about SARS, AIDS and bird flu. Now researchers from Australia claim we're about to be hit by a new epidemic, motivational deficiency disorder. According to the British Medical Journal one in five people are said to suffer from motivational deficiency disorder, or MODIT, and most don't even know they have it. Symptoms include being unable to get out of bed in the morning, being trapped on the couch, or wanting to spend the entire day at the beach.